जय ओम विष्णुपाद परमहंस परिव्राज काचार्य अष्टोत्तरषद श्री श्रीमद इस डिवाइन ग्रेस अभय चरणारविंद भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी शिल प्रभुपाद की अनंत कोटि वैष्णव वृंद की ग्रंथराज श्रीमद भागवतम की ताई गौर प्रेमानंदे ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ग्रंथराश्रम भागवतम Canto 1, Chapter 13, entitled Mitrashtra Quits Home, Text 27. Yaha Svakat Parato Veha Jata Nirveda Atmavan Riddhi Kritva Haringe Hath प्रव्रजेत सनरोत्तमः यह स्वकात परतो वेह जात निर्वेद आत्मवान रदी कृत्वा हरिम्गे हाथ प्रव्रजेत सनरोत्तमः यह स्वकात परतो वेह जात निर्वेद आत्मवान रदी कृत्वा हरिम्गे हाथ प्रव्रजेत सनरोत्तमः यह एनीवन हु स्वकात बाय हिज ओन अवेकनिंग परतह वा और बाय हियरिंग फ्रॉम अनदर यह हियर इन दिस वर्ल्ड जात बिकम्स निर्वेदह इंडिफरेंट टू मटेरियल एक्जिस्टेंस सॉरी मटेरियल अटैचमेंट आत्मवान कॉन्शियसनेस हृदय विद इन द हार्ट कृत्वा हैविंग बीन टेकन बाय हरिम द पर्सनालिटी ऑफ गॉड हेड गेहात फ्रॉम होम प्रव्रजेत गोज अवे सह ही इज नरोत्तम द फर्स्ट क्लास ह्यूमन बीइंग ट्रांसलेशन एंड परपोर्ट बाय हिज डिवाइन ग्रेस इसी भक्ति वेदांत
Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation. He is certainly a first class man who awakens and understands, either by himself or from others, the falsity and misery of this material world, and thus leaves home and depends fully on the personality of Godhead residing within his heart. Purport. There are three classes of transcendentalists, namely, one, the dhira or the one who is not disturbed by being away from family association. Two, one in the renounced order of life, a sannyasi by frustrated sentiment. Three, a sincere devotee of the Lord who awakens God consciousness by hearing and chanting and leaves home depending completely on the personality of Godhead who resides in his heart. The idea is that the renounced order of life after a frustrated life of sentiment in the material world may be the stepping stone on the path of self-realization. But real perfection of the path of liberation is attained when one is practiced to depend fully on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who lives in everyone's heart as Paramatma. One may live in the darkest jungle alone out of home, but a steadfast devotee knows very well that he is not alone. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is with him and he can protect his sincere devotee in any awkward circumstance. One should therefore practice devotional service at home, hearing and chanting the holy name, quality, form, pastimes, entourage, etc. In, the associ in association with pure devotees. And this practice will help one awaken God consciousness in proportion to one's sincerity of purpose. One who desires material benefit by such devotional activities can never depend on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, although he sits in everyone's heart. Nor does the Lord give any direction to persons who worship him for material gain. Such materialistic devotees may be blessed by the Lord with material benefits, but they cannot reach the stage of the first class human being as above mentioned. There are many examples of such sincere devotees in the history of the world, especially in India, and they are our guides on the path of self-realization. Mahatma Vidura is one such great devotee of the Lord, and we should all try to follow in his lotus footsteps for self-realization. Om Ajnati Mirandhasya Gyanan Jinishalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarine Vancha Kalpataru Vyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Grateful to be here back. I was three months here just before I went to a tour of America I came back yesterday and uh, today we are discussing one of the most significant pastimes in the Srimad Bhagavatam in terms of the power of spiritual sound to infuse renunciation and devotion. So I'll talk broadly on the topic today about three conceptions of renunciation and how we all have, a, we have to go far in the journey to develop the perfection of renunciation. So, these three conceptions are summarized using the acronym FAR, F-A-R. So, F, F is frustration. In the, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the 18th chapter, Krishna talks about the three modes of material nature and he uses the three modes as an analytical framework to incisively look into everything. 
even things that are normally considered good, laudable, virtuous, Krishna says that we need a nuanced vision of those things. That's why yajna dana tapa, sacrifice, austerity, charity, these would normally be good, but Krishna says no, they can also be in the three modes. And similarly, renunciation can also be in the three modes. Tyaga Tribheda, Krishna talks about in the 18th chapter. Now, basically, the point is that we human beings have intrinsically a divided existence. We are spiritual beings residing in material bodies. And while that is the condition of all living beings, but non-human living beings do not have the capacity to perceive their spirituality. Hmm. I consciously use the word non-human beings. Previously, I would have used the word subhuman. But nowadays, with the egalitarian culture, they say, why should other living beings be considered lesser? That why subhuman? So why non-human? Sometimes the more politically word, correct word is more than human world. Not, not just non-human, more than human world. So the idea is, this comes from a Judeo-Christian anthropocentric worldview, where the existence of all the other life forms was considered simply just a backdrop for the central drama of human redemption through Jesus Christ. So animals had no significance at all. And that's why if you consider the pendulum, it is going from one extreme where the animals had no significance to now animals have the highest significance. So that's why the subhuman world, if you use the word subhuman, that's considered offensive to animals. So it's a non-human world. So, so what happens is we humans have the capacity to seek something more than what the material body and what the material world offers. And that is why we feel a sense of discontent that constantly ignores at our existence to different degrees. So, because of this, sometime or the other, we may seek something beyond the world. And that is where renunciation comes in. So now when I'm talking about these four, three things, three conceptions of renunciation, the first is frustration. Normally, our desires are directed towards, even captivated by, the objects of this world. And we keep seeking them. But sometimes, we just don't get them. And when we don't get them, we experience frustration. So we could say, if we again consider a pendulum, frust frustration is the opposite of infatuation. When we are infatuated, obsessed, captivated by something, and I want it, I want it now. And when I don't get it, then I get frustrated. So this, this, so this is something which we all experience. Prabhupada talks about this in the Bhaktira Samrut Sindhu as bhoga and tyaga. Significantly, there are two degrees in this. In general, frustration is circumstantial and temporary. Mm. Almost everyone gets frustrated with life. Mm. Uh, or, uh, let me put it more, more precisely. Almost everyone gets frustrated in life. But very few people get frustrated with life. So frustrated in life means, oh, this went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong. But frustrated with life means, a person starts thinking, why should I even be living? And that's a terrible thing to have. You know, that level of frustration is quite dangerous. And in fact, the ethos of uh, human autonomy, that we are the makers of not just our destiny, but we are the makers of our conception of life, of our conception of the meaning of life. That has become so deeply enshrined in today's world that even people 
say that the right to human autonomy our capacity to do what our our power to do what we want to do should be extended to such an extent that people say that we should have the right to live and the right to end our life so in so germany was the first country in the world which legalized the right to commit suicide so the idea is that you you are your own master if you want to live you should live if you don't want to live you should commit suicide so there was a case in uh in america this has not been adopted america is highly polarized between the right wing christians and the left wing liberals so there was a there was a generally in america the uh, it is the right wing people who are more nationalistic and assertive of this, their country's stature and glory so they go into defense and they fight many of these war veterans you know we from the rest of the world's perspective we see how america goes and does regime change wars and creates trouble like they did in afghanistan but it's not just trouble for the rest of the world it's for america also so many of these war veterans they often have lifelong traumas so there was this veteran who called the um, so these veterans are so traumatized there are special helplines for them that you know so they were so traumatized he called a helpline and when he said that i am so depressed so so he happened to be a complete right wing person and the person who was on the helpline was a left wing person so the left wing person suggested to him you know if you are so traumatized why don't you commit suicide i can help you in that and he was so enraged he said i, I come here to help and he says i am offering you help <laughs> so the value system is so conflicted so the left wing person thinks that you know okay if you are unhappy in life what's the point of living and then it led to a huge scandal and that person was suspended and they said that we have to investigate they're going to go the log of all the calls that come on helpline how many people who call for help are actually offered help in the form of consolation and strength and how many are offered help in the form of okay you want to commit suicide we'll help you in that so they are investigating that so the point is frustration itself is quite common but it is one thing to be frustrated in life it's another thing to be frustrated with life and that is far in far more dangerous and this second phenomena is happening more and more in today's world that not just frustration in life but frustration with life that's happening because overall the the hype of the world's pleasures is so much greater than normal yes the sense objects in this world always look attractive but they are hyped up much more in the world to the media today and then the, the ex- anticipation and expectation of pleasure becomes so high anticipation is i am going to get it expectation means i am entitled to it i deserve it so the anticipation and expectation becomes so high that when it doesn't come through person starts feeling what am i even living for so the very rational for existence as they say resonate uh, the very purpose why i am living that becomes thwarted why should i live at all so it's uh, we we from the indian perspective we think in america is all materialistic well yes but more and more in america they are calling this is as the arising of the post material values so post material is not non material post material is not spiritual necessarily post material culture means people are not primarily obs- worried about basic material things like food clothing shelter think these will be taken care of post material things okay what more in life i want some meaning i want some purpose in life they may not turn to spirituality for that but they want meaning and purpose and somebody may define their find their meaning and purpose in their career somebody may find the meaning and purpose in our relationship and if these get frustrated and they think what is the point even of living so at least when there is mati there are material values people are conscientious about protecting their life but post material values if life doesn't have meaning what is the point of living it becomes like that 
and that's why euthanasia voluntary ending of one's life that's what i talked about the right to commit suicide that they rephrase it as dying with dignity that their idea is that if i don't want to live if i'm unhappy if i'm terminally sick if the quality of my life is poor what is the point of living with such indignity let me end my life so dying with dignity so that's frustration with life is quite common so it's uh in the western world people have become so cynical about the idea of lasting relationships and uh, finding some love in relationships that at most contemporary hollywood movies they are very rarely about romance there was an article in i think washington post how america fell out of love with love <laughs> that means it's not that the sensual desires are not there but the idea that the sensual desires as a material attraction can lead to love and a lost lasting relationship through love that is considered utopian and unrealistic and one result of this is mostly the idea of romance in movies comes mostly in christian movies mainstream hollywood movies even if they have romance they will have some kind of twist not straight romance is not there because people have become too cynical with it and that's why relationships are also very unsteady and <clears throat> not only that along with it especially in the catholic church and even in some buddhist denominations the number of people who become frustrated with the world and join the renounced order is increasing substantially but interestingly at least in the catholic church it is the number of women who are becoming nuns is far greater than the number of men who are becoming priests so they are having a pastoral crisis uh, because at least in the catholic church right now they have the idea that the main priest who does mass has the has to be a male and a renunci renunciate they don't use the word renunciate they use a celibate so the word monk is more used in uh, buddhists a monk is not used so much by christians they use celibates so they're not having so on one side men are not becoming many men are not becoming they embracing the celibacy but many women are joining nunneries so they are increasing and that is also leading to the pressure that women should also be allowed to officiate in the catholic church but the point is this frustration with life not just frustration in life but frustration with life it is quite common so there was a new york times article about this phenomena of many young women becoming nuns and the problem with this is that they it's not so much that they are attracted to jesus or to god as they are frustrated with relationships frustrated primarily with men and this is not a sustainable platform for maintaining one's of one turning away from the world what happens is the nature of the world is that even if it frustrates us it the world itself cannot purify us hmm? the world can frustrate us but not purify us of course the word purify has a positive connotation unfortunately sometimes nowadays the way we use it the word purify has a negative connotation that means so if we go to somebody's house for prasad and then they ask how was the prasad and if you say it was purifying <laughs> they will get alarmed what happened <laughs> was it not cooked properly did it not taste good <laughs> so so actually it <laughs> so purifying somehow has got that connotation of being very difficult austere unpleasant but good so it is unpleasant but beneficial so tolerate it accept it but purifying doesn't have to be like that purify basically means that our lower desires they those impure desires they start disappearing so frustration is more that the lower desires are not being fulfilled but purific purification is that the lower desires themselves get removed so there are two different things frustration is more exter out external cause and purification is more of a internal change 
So related with this frustration itself is the second thing, that is aversion. So I was talking about the acronym F A R FAR. So A is aversion, whereas frustration is more circumstantial and short-lived. Aversion is much more lasting and deep-rooted. Interestingly, both have something in common. In both, one's driving emotion is still related with the world. That it is all oh, the this particular this particular thing is so difficult to get. It's so troublesome. Just forget it. Hmm? That's frustration. Aversion is more deep-rooted. So uh, aversion involves not just annoyance or irritation, but anger or even hatred. And this is terrible. And in one sense, among frustration and aversion, I frustration is it can be a stimulus for the spiritual path. Artho Krishna says, those who are distressed, they come towards him. But when somebody is averse, then it's much more difficult. In general, I'll talk about personal spirituality a little later. When there is aversion, when there is frustration, there is hope and there is annoyance or irritation because the hope has been frustrated. But when there is aversion, there is no hope itself. And this is such a terrible thing. And not, not that I didn't get it and so I'm, I'm unfortunate. That this thing is so terrible that nobody should be pursuing it. And I want to destroy this from the world itself. And aversion can lead one to much stronger negative emotions. So whereas frustration is associated with anger, aversion is associated with hatred. And the difference between anger and hatred is that anger is more hot-headed. It comes, it stays for time, it, sometimes it goes away. Whereas hatred is cold-blooded. Hatred is much more calculative, sinister. So similarly, aversion is much more deep-rooted. So generally, most people will not rationalize or philosophize frustration. I'm just frustrated. But aversion can be rationalized and philosophized. That means one can give intellectual justification for one's aversion. And that can make things even more toxic. So in the Bhagavatam it says, Nati Sakto, Nati Nirvind. No. So if you're considering the pendulum, one side I said is this, it's frustration, the opposite side is obsession or infatuation. Now if you consider the next is aversion, the opposite of aversion is, is attachment. So again, if you consider the difference between attachment and say infatuation, infatuation is a little more short-lived. Attachment is more long-lasting, it's more deep-rooted. So we know attachment is bad, but even aversion is bad. Aversion is unhealthy because it still keeps our emotions locked in the world. The point is that not that the world is a terrible place. The point is that there is a better place in the world. The point is not that the body is the source of misery. The point is that the soul is capable, soul can be the source of sublime happiness. And we need to focus on the soul. So, frustration and aversion, uh, both are incomplete to varying degrees. And they can be harmful or helpful depending on how the person is overall disposed. And if they are in good association, here is the script, Swakat Parato Veha. That if one is by own one's own contemplation or by one's association, consultation with others. So contemplation or consultation. Either way, if one can go further, okay, this is terrible, but what is better? Is there something better? So when we think about that, that is where we come to the third part of uh, third F A R. R is redirection. Redirection is what is essentially the purpose of renunciation. And at a philosophical level, if we think, or even a psychological level, even a philosophical level, that when we feel, oh, this is terrible, the very fact that we think something is terrible suggests that there should be something better. 
Like if somebody is blind and they are lamenting about their blindness, that implies that there is some, some state other than blindness which is better than blindness. If there were no state other than blindness, then a person wouldn't think about of blindness as bad. They wouldn't lament the blindness because that's, that's the way things are. Isn't it? So, similarly, the very fact that we experience frustration or aversion with the world suggests that there is some state of being which is higher. Now, we may not know how to attain that state, where that state is, but without that inkling, without that clue, without that hint, without that sixth sense that there is something higher, one will not feel frustrated. And if they feel frustrated means, okay, there is something better, there should be something better, and I'm not experiencing it. So, redirection involves two things. When we redirect, we seek and we believe. Now, some people try to black and white differentiate between, say, Dharmic religions and Abrahamic religions. And they say the Abrahamic religions are all about believing, whereas the Vedic, Vedic Dharmic religions are all about seeking. It's not that simple. Generally, any sharp categorization of complex realities, it's best to treat it with suspicion. Because reality is very complex. Yes, there is definitely a greater emphasis on seeking than on believing in the Vedic tradition. That's why Athato Brahma Jigyasa, Arjuna is asking questions. And Krishna also urges Arjuna to deliberate and decide. Krishna doesn't talk about commandments in the Bhagavad Gita. So, but at this, so in that sense, it's true that there is a greater emphasis on seeking. However, seeking itself requires believing. Because when we are seeking, we are already believing that there is something worth seeking. Otherwise, why would we be seeking also? Like if somebody is digging for gold under the ground, they have to be digging, but while digging, they are already believing that there is gold. Otherwise, why would they be digging? So seeking requires believing. So this redirection means, okay, I, I want to look for something beyond this world. But that requires the belief that there is something beyond this world that I am seeking. And within that, so I talked about three conceptions of renunciation. Now I am elaborating on, on redirection. In redirection, there could be broadly three aspects. The first is detachment. Now detachment is different from aversion. If we consider there is attachment, there is aversion. Two sides of a pendulum. Detachment is in between. So attachment means strong positive emotions. Aversion means strong negative emotions. Whereas detachment means no, emo no strong emotions. I'm detached from this. That means I'm not emotionally fixated in this. So detachment is what the broad attitude needs to be for somebody who seeks something beyond this world. And we see this, Krishna, uh, talking, Krishna talking about it repeatedly. Uh, he talks about asakta. Not asakta, but asakta. Virakta. Anasakta. Detachment. So, there is Raga and Dvesha and there is Vairagya. So, Vairagya, you could say it also involves, includes Vaidvesha. That there is also absence of aversion, not just absence of attachment, but also absence of aversion. And here, when Vidura is instructing, instructing Dhritarashtra, so Vidura has instructed Dhritarashtra many times in the past. Unfortunately, none of those instructions work. Sometimes, like it said, Vidura is the example of how strong speech cuts the illusion of conditioned souls. Well, yes, and uh, maybe not. Because Vidura's speech was strong throughout the Mahabharata. So it is not just strong speech cuts, strong speech at the right time cuts. 
and vidura maintained his relationship with dhritarashtra for a long time and that is how finally now his words are cutting the illusion so there are times when dhritarashtra would get frustrated with the duryodhan duryodhan would again and again come up with some shenanigans come up with some some crazy ideas some machinations about how he will gain the kingdom and dhritarashtra would oscillate oh no 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 there's no need to do this oh if you want to do it you can do it and sometimes he would get frustrated when krishna came as the shanti doot and krishna spoke within a few minutes minutes of krishna speaking dhritarashtra was convinced and dhritarashtra said okay shiva i don't need to be convinced it is my son who doesn't listen to me so please speak to him and make him see sense and that is why later when the whole effort for the shanti doot fails the krishna's attempted peace fails actually it all fails because of duryodhan's uh, insolence his arrogance his obstinacy now most of us know what did duryodhan say when he rejected krishna's peace proposal does anyone remember yeah yes i will not give enough land to even put the tip of a needle through thank you so now at the level of dialogue it seems very uh, it can seem impressive but in terms of context it's not impressive it's it's insulting because say to give, give, to get a sense of this suppose we invite someone for a program and they don't want to come so they make an excuse now they are making an excuse we know that they are making an excuse and they know that we know that they are making an excuse hmm but still there is some level of politeness by which they are trying to make an excuse it is saying that hypocrisy is the last respect that vice offers to virtue <laughs> that means that somebody is evil and they openly act evil that means they don't even respect the idea of good somebody is evil they act good that means they at least respect the idea of good so this person is saying no to the invitation but at least they are having the decency to come up with some reason hmm i was with what devotee what devotee had invited somebody for his relative for a program this devotee is very cutting in his speech so he said that so that that relative gave some excuse why is not coming for the program so this devotee told him that you know you know you know if you are going to speak a lie at least don't insult my intelligence by speaking a and speak a believable lie <laughs> so what he meant is that if somebody is doing something wrong but at least they are not openly showing it that indicates some level of some level of respect so and i'm not saying be hypocritical just to show respect but i'm making a, a different point over here suppose we invite somebody for a program and then they say that even if i die my dead body will never come for your program this is not just a refusal it is a rejection it is not just saying no to someone who has knocked at the door but it's rather not even just banging the door in their face it is kicking on their mouth and then knocking them away so that is what arjuna did that is what sorry duryodhana did when he rejected krishna's peace proposal it was insulting and then when krishna was departing the next day krishna turned to all the kuru members kuru elders oh kuru elders all of you have seen duryodhana's shamelessness and the king's helplessness all of you have heard the king admit in public that krishna deliberately uses the word king over there all of you heard the word king admit in public that he has no control over the sun uh, all of you know who is the cause of this war and who will be responsible for the destruction of the kuru dynasty so the this is a detour but i'm making the detour for a particular reason this incident the point is that when there is when there is strong uh, dhritarashtra would get frustrated with duryodhan but that frustration 
was not strong enough to lead to detachment. So because the emotions were still involved, there's frustration, and then again there was infatuation, obsession. How can I displease him? How can I do something that will hurt him, that will anger him, that will annoy him? I can't do it. So, but finally, when the Duryodhana has been killed, when all his sons have been killed, at that time, what has happened is, now there is not much time for, not much, not avenue for those emotional attachments to stay. And that is how he will move towards detachment. Detachment. So emotions, gen generally, they stay for a long, long time. And all the more so if the object which is triggering our emotions is there in front of us. It can be attachment, it can be aversion. But when that object is irreversibly removed from somebody's life, as happened to the Trashtra, when Duryodhana was killed, then there is no more a chance for him to direct his emotions in that direction. And that's how he becomes open for something higher. So that's detachment. And although Prabhupada refers to this verse, talks about Paramat Narottama, Pravrajetsa Narottamaha. So Narottama is the best among human beings. So anybody who stops pursuing worldly pleasures or who stops making the pursuit of worldly pleasures as the primary purpose of their life, that person is considered elevated. Because they are thinking something higher. Pravrutiresha Bhutanam Nivrutistu Mahafalam. The Manusruti says that Pravrutti, pursuing worldly desires, that is the Esha Bhutanam, that is the way of all living beings. But Nivrutis to Mahafalam, those who can turn away from this, from the pursuit of worldly pleasures, they, are, they can get a greater result, Mahafalam. So here, Vidura, through his strong words, is directing the Trashtra towards Nivrutti now. And he will come to detachment, but in detachment also there are multiple levels. And because the Trashtra has consistently allowed Duryodhan to not just offend, but hurt, injure, and even kill, attempt to kill the Pandavas. So for him, the devotion toward Krishna doesn't emerge so quickly. So his, his, the success for him is detachment. Beyond that, he doesn't go forward. So there are two, st in, I talk about, I'm talking about redirection now. In redirection, the first thing is, okay, no more emotional involvement in this. But then there are two further stages. There is spiritual attachment, and there is spiritual engagement. So I'll conclude with these points and we can have a few questions. So attachment is more at the level of emotion. Engagement is more at the level of action. And when one goes beyond detachment, okay, I'm not, my emotions are not locked in this world. But where are the emotions directed? In the impersonal liberation, there is not much scope for emotions. Because there is, the idea of emotions itself is considered an illusion. So one goes beyond emotions to a state of emotional, emotionless quiescence. Not nations, but quiescence. Quiescence is like a complete quietness. Mm. But in, we understand that beyond that quiescence, that, uh, that quietitude of, that, uh, of Brahman, there is Bhagawan. And with Bhagawan, there is personal reciprocation. And the reciprocation is both external and internal. Ma manusmara yudhyacha. Yudhyacha is external, ma manusmara is internal. So those two are the phases of, are the more where the redirection goes towards completion. And that is when, when this redirection is, attains its completion, that's when a person becomes narottamaha. And in this, there is, if Krishna talks about our, Asakti or Virakti, Asakti and Virakti in the sixth chapter or the first six chapters quite often. Uh, that similar words, be detached, Nisanga. But from the seventh chapter, the first verse itself, Krishna's mood and emphasis changes. The very first word is Mai Asaktamanaha, 7.1. That, that is the phase going from detachment to spiritual attachment. And so, Krishna talks about the development of spiritual attachment, interestingly, through the practice of yoga. Mayasakta manaha partha yogam yunjan madashrayaha 
असंशयम समग्रम माम यथा ज्ञास तु सो योगा इन्वॉल्व एट लीस्ट द वे कृष्णा टॉक्स अबाउट इट इन्वॉल्व एक्टिविटी ही इज टॉकिंग अबाउट भक्ति योगा ओवर देर सो कर्म योगा कैन एक्चुअली टेक वन फ्रॉम फ्रस्ट्रेशन एंड एवर्जन टूवर्ड्स डिटैचमेंट बट कर्म योगा इट सेल्फ के नॉट टेक वन फर्दर वन नीड्स टू गो फर्दर देन टूवर्ड्स स्पिरिचुअल अटैचमेंट एंड स्पिरिचुअल एंगेजमेंट एज भक्ति योगा इज रिक्वायर्ड नाउ इन दिस एज अ सेट अटैचमेंट इज इंटरनल एंगेजमेंट इज एक्सटर्नल सो विच कम्स फर्स्ट डू वी डेवलप अटैचमेंट टू कृष्णा एंड देन वी डू एंगेजमेंट इन कृष्णा सर्विस और डू वी एंगेज इन कृष्णा सर्विस एंड वी डेवलप अटैचमेंट Yes, actually, it is ye na ke na prakare na mana Krishna ni veshi. Whichever works. In general, engagement is easier. That's why Krishna in twelve eight to twelve eleven, when he talks about multiple levels of bhakti, he says, if you are attached to me, your mind and intelligence will be immersed in me. Mai aavesh mano ye ma itte yukta vasam. Mai eva mana adhatsu mai buddhim ni veshi ya nivasishya si mai eva ataur dhamna samshaya. Krishna says, if you have that attachment, then it's not that you will attain me. He says, you are already in me. You are already living with me. Mm. But then, if you don't have that attachment, he says, you develop the attachment by the practice of sadhana. Atha chittam samadha tum na shakno si mai sthiram abhyas yogi na tato mam ichcha tum dhananjaya. And then he says, if you can't do that also, if you cannot focus on, you cannot sustain focus sadhana for a long time. Then he said, next is abhyase pya samarthosi matkarma paramo bhava madartham api karvani kurvan siddhi mavapsi. See, so matkarma, karma is engagement. So in one sense, you could say it's hierarchical that there is the highest is spiritual attachment. But if we can't have spiritual attachment, then we strive to develop spiritual attachment. If we can't follow the process for developing spiritual attachment also continuously, then have spiritual engagement. So in that sense, we can say that spiritual engagement comes first. Spiritual attachment comes afterwards. However, it's not just it's not just linear and hierarchical. It's also cyclic, because the highest devotees, the gopis, for example, are not just having spiritual attachment. They are having also spiritual engagement. They are not just immersed in meditation to Krishna. God Krishna. They are actually doing some things for Krishna. So that's why we have the kanishta, madhyama, and uttama. And the uttama again comes down at the madhyama level. The idea is that at the highest level, one does not withdraw from the world to practice bhakti. Rather, one re re one returns to activity, but with a higher purpose. So for us, in our practice of bhakti, sometimes we fi fixate on renunciation too much. Oh, I want to give up this. I want to give up this. Now, renunciation could be either in terms of adopting the renounced order. or it could be in terms of giving up a particular habit particular attachment particular behavior particular sense object and sometimes we start defining our spiritual growth and even our spiritual stature based solely on our capacity to give up something now that is a unhealthy focus that is the unhealthy parameter for defining ourselves of a spiritual growth because none of us know how deep rooted the impressions are and how strongly those impressions may arise again we don't know say by our practice of bhakti we might be able to give up a particular behavior particular indulgence but then we think we think oh i gave this up therefore i'm advancing but then sometimes it is just that suddenly the desires will start coming and we may get swept away so we are in the bhava sagar we are in the ocean of material existence and slowly we are in one sense moving towards the coast of eternity the shore of eternity beyond which we will go into the ocean of devotion but while we are moving towards the shore of eternity sometimes strong waves may come and normally if the waves are of a, of a modest strength we may be able to resist it quite easily but just as what exactly causes which wave to be how strong it's not so easy to detect that one of my 
her close friend is known as PhD in ocean dynamics, marine science. So he said that we can detect when a tsunami-like wave comes. Usually there is some earthquake or something like that has happened. But if there are 10 waves, they are all of different amplitudes. Exactly why, which wave was of high amplitude? It's very difficult to discern. So similarly for us, sometimes we get agitated and we feel overwhelmed by particular desires and we can find a cause for that. Oh, but sometimes the, the desires may just rise and we can't figure out why this has happened. So at that, if we had defined our spiritual growth solely by our capacity to give up something, and then suddenly that particular desire comes up as a powerful wave, Urmi, as a wave it comes up. Kulishikar Maharaj talks about how this material world is like an ocean, and in this there are waves which come up, waves of illusion. So a giant tsunami-like wave might come and just sweep us away. And you may think, what is the use of my spiritual life? I was practicing for so long, and still I had this relapse. Did I even advance or all my, was, was all my advancement simply a facade? No, it was not necessarily a facade. Rather, we may have had an unhealthy parameter for our spiritual growth. The healthier parameter is, yes, of course, we want to give up uh, worldly attachments, we want to give up worldly intelligences. But in bhakti, it is a much better to base our spiritual steadiness and spiritual growth on our, on how diligently we stay connected with Krishna. That means, to continue that ocean metaphor, sometimes swaves may come and sweep a person away. Now, even if I plan, no, I won't be swept away by any wave. But if a wave is far bigger than what I am, what can I do? However, if we can learn to hold on to an anchor and diligently practice holding on to an anchor, then even if the wave comes, the wave may hit us, the wave may hurl us. But if we just hold on to the anchor, then we won't be swept away. And that holding on to the anchor is the practice of Bhakti Yoga. It is not just the practice of any particular limb of Bhakti, but it is, it is the practice of fixing our consciousness on Krishna. Now it could be through chanting, it could be through scriptural study, it could be through Kirtan, it could be through worship of the deities. Whatever it is that helps us fix our mind on Krishna. So we need to do that more and more so that we can hold on to that anchor. Maam chayo vibicharena bhakti yogena sevate. Sagunan samatiti aitan brahma bhuyaya kalpate. Krishna says that the modes will come. How will we transcend the modes? Not just by analysis, but by attraction to Krishna, by fixed holding on to Krishna. So if we do this, we focus on how quickly, how firmly, how repeatedly I hold on to the anchor of Krishna. We do that, and even if we get swept away by a wave, we won't stay swept away for long. Now we may fall down, but we don't have to fall away. But we can immediately come back to Krishna as quickly as possible. And that is the mood of Apichet Sudharacharo Pachite Imamananya Bhak. Sadhureva Samantavya Samyak Vivasito Hisaha. So if Samyak Vivasito is there, Bajate Maam Ananya Bhak is there, then how is Sudurachara possible? If somebody is <clears throat> determined to serve Krishna, if somebody is... Then how can they do some terrible thing? So the determined to serve Krishna means they are very strongly resolved to hold on to the anchor. But Durachara means Sometimes a wave comes and sweeps them away. So they are swept away, they feel bad about it. But they don't just keep beating themselves up for that. As soon as that wave stops, immediately they hold on. And the wonderful thing about Krishna is, like sometimes we may hold on to anchor, and the wave comes and it sweeps us away. But then, now the anchor is far away and I am far away, what do I do? Uh, Krishna is like the anchor who extends throughout the material ocean. So we may be swept away from the anchor, but wherever we may be swept away, Krishna is there also. We just need to hold on to that anchor again. So whether it is through spiritual attachment, whether it is through spiritual engagement, somehow or the other, whatever it is, sometimes we feel like practicing bhakti and so we practice bhakti. Sometimes we practice bhakti and then we feel attraction to Krishna. Whatever it is, somehow hold on to that anchor. And if we focus on that, then the unnecessary emotional energy that gets dissipated in, 
oh will i be able to renounce should i renounce oh i couldn't renounce i renounced but i got i had a relapse all that wasted emotional energy and unnecessary emotional agony that we go through we can substantially decrease that and we can steadily move towards immersion in krishna towards what what the bhagavad talks about narottamaha becoming the best of human beings by fulfilling the purpose of human life by be completely immersed in love for krishna both through spiritual attachment and spiritual engagement so i'll summarize i spoke today about three broad conception three conceptions of renunciation so f a r f was what frustration so i talked about many things how because the hype of material enjoyment is so high in today's world many people get frustrated not just in life but with life so how uh, in hollywood there are hardly any romantic movies because people have fallen out of love with love how people are especially young people especially young females are they so hopeless about relationships that they are choosing to become nuns not in the huge numbers but still significant numbers more than what was 20 30 years ago so frustration is not renunciation because one's emotion is still caught in the world so frustration is just the opposite of obsession and when frustration becomes more deep rooted it becomes not just oh i couldn't get it it's so bad but it goes to this is terrible that is aversion so frustration is more hot headed aversion is more cold blooded it's leads to hatred and that can be even more damaging for our spiritual growth because our emotions become very not just caught in worldly things but in emotion that those emotions are rationalized and philosophized and justified with our intelligence and that's problematic but beyond frustration and aversion we go towards far redirection so we humans have a divided existence our consciousness is so evolved that we just can't be satisfied with the pleasures offered by the material body in the material world so renunciation begins with there must be something more now we seek something more but seeking and believing both go together for seeking we need to have believe that there's something worth seeking and in that redirection i talk about three stages first is detachment where we go beyond this pendulum i emotionally attract emotionally strong positive emotion strong negative emotion no strong emotion at all and from it is that this is the level where somebody who is spiritually serious but without any personal conception can come to but with the personal conception of the ultimate reality you go to the next two stages that is spiritual attachment and spiritual engagement attachment is more at the level of emotions engagement at the level of actions so we start from wherever we are and we move forward in our spiritual journey and for us when we are pers- on the bhakti path sometimes we f- focus fixate too much on renunciation and that can lead to a lot of distraction and distress because sometimes we may not be able to give up something sometimes we give up something and we may relapse because the waves how big they will come in future we don't know so instead of simply resolving i will not get swept away by a wave we focus on i will hold on to the anchor so the activity by which we can fix our consciousness on krishna that is the bhakti activity that we need to cherish and by that krishna uh, we can no even if we get swept away we'll soon come back to krishna and that is, that's how we will ultimately attain absorption in krishna and attain krishna, the world of krishna thank you very much hare krishna is there any any quick question yes bro no you, you can ask you have the mic uh-huh. hare bol prabhu ji you spoke about uh, when the object which triggers emotion is in front of us is difficult to detach but for the trashta it was irreversibly removed hmm. but most of the time object will be in front of us only yes so how do you deal with that situation yeah so if the object is right in front of us always how do we actually become detached yeah that is a challenge the two three things are there first is uh, rather than just uh, like putting all tempting objects in one category mm mm-hmm. Uh, like reducing all tempting objects to one category is also in us is impersonal because say if somebody is attracted to food like there is there are there is there is increasing like there is alcoholics anonymous now there is foodaholics anonymous 
people are just they just can't either they eat too much or the other extreme they eat too little and they get anorexia and uh, things like that quite problematic so either way the point is that it's not that a, that person is attracted to all foods there are certain food items which they are attracted to way too much of course sometimes once one gets attracted infatuated then it, it almost become like a pig and i just eat anything and everything but the idea is that all tempting objects are not the same so we may not nobody can say stay away from food but if there are some objects which tempt us we can stay away from those we can create some boundaries hmm? so that's the first thing uh, we can create boundaries towards especially tempting objects for us tempting so uh, then second thing is that <coughs> apart from those boundaries where we boundaries is basically like a distance we create but when we are engaging also when we are we are inter we are interacting or we are perceiving krishna doesn't say that drishyato causes the problem it is dhyayato that causes the problem dhyayato vishayan pumsa sangaste shu pajayet it's not drishyato so it's not the encounter with the senses sense objects it is more the contemplation of the sense objects so if we can keep ourselves substantially engaged hmm, then what happens is we don't have time to dwell on this worldly objects so yes we will we we'll perceive the objects but the idle mind as they say is the devil's workshop so we try to keep ourselves busy that also helps in minimizing the effect of the perception and of course ultimately we need to spiritualize our vision that these are all objects in the in bhakti it's not just that these these objects are not meant for my enjoyment because they will lead to distress actually bhakti is everything attractive comes from krishna is meant for krishna so if we develop that vision seeing the krishna connection then the attachment will will the the this attachment for our selfish purposes or our self centered purposes will decrease thank you yes bro i will ask you why did dhritarashtra not kill duryodhan is his son why would he kill mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Why did Trishul not kill his son? Well, uh, nobody suggested killing, because that is, uh, you know, for a father to kill his son is is quite a strong thing to do. And but Vidura, based on the, based on the omens, when the Trishul was when the Trishul when the reason I was born, he said that this son is likely to be devilish, so abandon him. he didn't say kill him abandon him so he was not ready to do that also he was too attached so attachment basically prevents us from doing what is right so killing may not have been right of course if somebody becomes brutal then it's a different thing but for him it was so attached that he was not ready to even displease him leave alone kill him Just because of that attachment okay thank you you had a question yes prabhu ji uh, you, you discussed about aversion Uh, that point uh, it will not be helpful for uh, taking up uh, spiritual practices how that connection i could not understand because frustration leads to taking up something higher but aversion can also lead someone to because he is already frustrated and developed hatred towards material objects or material things yeah <coughs> it's a mm. like uh, okay i'll maybe not the most pleasant example but i'll illustrate this point that uh, i was in a i was at a temple in america where the, at one place where there are multiple temples and there was a couple who got divorced and it was a very acrimonious divorce and they had a lot of lot of negative emotions and everything so the first thing now both of them were in the of course as a family they were in the same temple and the first thing that their counselor told them is no you both cannot go to the same temple one of you go to this temple one of them go to other temple because what happens is you may come to the temple but now we may be thinking about krishna we want to think about krishna but the consciousness has that person come over here you know so when that relationship goes to the level of when we go to the level of aversion then what we are averse to occupies our mind much more 
then what we are meant to be attached, what we are spiritually directed towards, or spiritually attached. So, the so frustration is circumstantial. You know, we had a, we wanted somebody to do something, that person didn't do that, we are annoyed with them, we are frustrated with them. After some time, we will forget it. But aversion goes much more deep rooted. Now, aversion can also lead to spirituality. But the uh, the place that the that emotion of aversion, the emotions associated with aversion, have carved in our consciousness is much bigger. And sometimes that may consume a person so much that consume their consciousness so much that there is no place left for Krishna. Or Krishna can come only when the object of aversion is not there. Otherwise, that person Krishna cannot just come in over there. So that's why aversion can be more problematic. Hmm? Now, if somebody can go beyond the aversion, then so aversion can be a launching pad for devotion also. But it's 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 like you know, if a missile is to be launched, if there is dry ground, solid ground, it's easier. If there is marshy ground, it is much more difficult. So aversion is almost like marshy ground. Our emotions get consumed by the object. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. So thank you very much. Granthraj, Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Srila Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhaktavrinda ki, Chai, Gaur Primanam.